Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar entitled Introducing the NIH Intersociety Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics Pharmacogenomics Learning Series. These are new peer-reviewed online education uh, modules for healthcare professionals. My name is Roseanne Gamel, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Pharmacogenomics Project Group of ISCC PEG. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And I'm joined here today with my colleague, Dr. Philip Empey, who is the other co-chair of the Pharmacogenomics Project Group, and he is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy and Therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. And again, both very, very excited to share with you about this uh, new educational series that um, we have developed um, with our colleagues in the Pharmacogenomics Project Group of ISCC PEG. Next slide, please. So for our, our learning objectives for the next 30 minutes or so, we'd like to review first the importance of pharmacogenomics education for healthcare professionals and review the existing competency standards. And then secondly, to describe the new pharmacogenomics learning series for healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. So first, by way of background, just to give a, a high-level overview of the topic today, uh, a little bit about what is pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics is the field of study that lies at the intersection of pharmacology and genomics. It's the study of how our genes impact medication response. And what we're trying to do essentially is to personalize medication prescribing based on an individual's genetic profile. And in doing so, we hope to optimize medication outcomes for our patients. Next slide, please. So by uh, using genetic information essentially to guide our drug selection and dosing, the real goal here again is to, is to maximize the likelihood of drug efficacy and minimize the likelihood of adverse drug reactions. We know that uh, one size does not fit all in, in medicine and there are many factors that influence medication response uh, and genetics may be an important factor in that equation to take into consideration. So by using pharmacogenomic data and clinical practice. We're really hoping to cut down on that trial and error process of finding the right medication at the right dose for a patient. Next slide, please. It's important to note that pharmacogenomic variation is very, very common. So we've seen in study after study, uh, looking at cohorts of patients, you know, doing this type of testing, that 99% of people carry at least one medically actionable pharmacogenomic variant. And so it really um, speaks to the relevance of this topic and the real potential for it to have uh, an impact, a really big impact on patient care uh, by using this in, in our clinical practice. Next slide, please. There are several evidence-based pharmacogenomics resources for clinicians that are available that really help clinicians understand how to interpret these results and as well as how to apply them to patient care. I'm gonna briefly highlight three resources here, um, but there was a, a really great session this morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. And if you did uh, miss that session, know that there will be a recording posted soon um, to the genome.gov website for the healthcare professionals, uh, genomics uh, education week. Uh, so you can catch more details there. But just for a, a brief overview of some of the evidence-based pharmacogenomics resources that are available, uh, first we have the U.S. Food and Drug Administration drug labeling. Um, so currently there are over 350 medications where the FDA includes pharmacogenomic information in the labeling for the drug and that prescribing information. Um, and not all of that information is, is clinically actionable. It doesn't all associate with uh, medication changes necessarily or dosage adjustments, but some do. And so very, some very important uh, gene drug associations that are highlighted in some, some drug labels. In the middle here, we have CPIC, or the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. This is a, a global consortium that um, essentially its mission is to create evidence-based, peer-reviewed, freely available clinical practice guidelines 
for gene drug associations. Um, these guidelines are used worldwide to translate pharmacogenomics into clinical practice, and they really do a great job of really breaking down how do you interpret a genotype result, you know, a pharmacogenomic result that you would get back from a laboratory, and then how does that translate into very specific prescribing actions, whether that's a dosage adjustment or specific uh, medication selection recommendations. And then on the, the third panel there, we have PharmGKB, or the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base. Um, this is a resource that essentially provides a searchable database of, of genes, of drugs. You can also search for gene drug combinations, and it's going to pull in a lot of very nice curated information uh, about the gene or drug of, of interest. Um, it's going to show you uh, primary data, summaries of the primary data. It's going to pull in prescribing information from the FDA and other uh, regulatory agencies worldwide, as well as provide summaries and links to uh, available guidelines from CPIC, as well as other guideline writing groups. Next slide, please. So in terms of the current pharmacogenomics landscape, and some, I want to highlight a couple of factors that are really driving us towards um, needing uh, more education in pharmacogenomics for healthcare professionals. The first is, is limited implementation. So in the current you know, medical practice today, um, pharmacogenomics is not yet standard of care for many gene drug associations. So in spite of having available clinical pharmacogenomic tests and, and evidence-based guidelines, um, we, are, we are seeing a lag in terms of the implementation of this information into clinical practice. And a big reason for that is, is really we don't have enough you know, education for healthcare professionals yet in this space. So it makes sense that if clinicians um, don't know about pharmacogenomics, haven't had sufficient education, they're not going to be comfortable ordering these tests or interpreting and, and applying the results to patient care. So in order to bridge that gap uh, between the science of pharmacogenomics and its clinical application, education really is key um, in helping us to do that. Secondly, here we do see increasing patient access to pharmacogenomic information, oftentimes outside the traditional healthcare paradigm. So yes, we do have clinical testing. There are a number of sites across the US, for instance, that are really leading in the clinical implementation of pharmacogenomics, and they have really robust um, implementation services. Uh, where pat many patients are getting this type of testing, but again, that, that's not routine um, in all healthcare settings as of yet. But outside of the clinical setting, patients uh, increasingly are getting access to this information often on, on their own accord. Um, so for example, there is such a thing as, as consumer-initiated provider-mediated testing. It's kind of a semi-direct-to-consumer model in that patients can go online essentially to a pharmacogenomic testing company's website, um, order a pharmacogenomic test, and a physician who's employed by the company can then sign off on the order. And then the patient can submit their sample and get back clinical pharmacogenomic results that can be used to guide their medication therapy. Um, and so in this particular instance, there's no direct patient provider relationship there, but the patient's really taking uh, the initiative to get, get this data on their own, and then they may bring it to their primary care provider or other healthcare professionals. Uh, we also have true direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic testing that's available as well. And so this is a model where there is no healthcare professional involvement at all. Um, and the, the consumer can, again, um, you know, buy a, a direct-to-consumer genetic testing kit, submit their sample to the company, and get the results directly. Um, then it's up to the consumer then to determine, you know, when and how they want to share those results with other healthcare professionals. Now, for most direct-to-consumer genetic tests, they do need clinical confirmation before use in, uh, you know, guiding medical care. However, pharmacogenomics, in pharmacogenomics, there are a couple of, of exceptions to that currently, and so some direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test results may be able to be used directly um, to guide uh, prescribing. 
And then lastly, here we have research. So um, there are ongoing research initiatives in pharmacogenomics, whereby research participants may receive a pharmacogenomic test results. And a really great example of that that's ongoing right now is the NIH's All of Us Research Program. And so their goal is to enroll a million uh, participants from across the United States in a large precision medicine kind of research program. And as part of that program, they are returning genetic results directly back to research participants. Um, this includes uh, genetic tests, genetic results for disease risk, but also pharmacogenomic results. Uh, a caveat here is that these are research results, so they do requ require clinical confirmation. But um, you can imagine that many people who are receiving this information will then turn around and bring it to their healthcare professionals and, and ask them about about, you know, getting confirmatory testing and asking them to explain those results and, and what they mean for their care. So again, in summary here, all of this kind of pointing to the need for more uh, education pharmacogenomics for healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. So when it comes to uh, genomics education uh, for healthcare professional, there are competency standards, competencies that have been published uh, for a number of different healthcare professional disciplines. Um, you can find uh, links to these different healthcare professional competencies on the Genome Ed uh, resource. It's part of the genome.gov uh, website and the link is down there below. Um, genome Ed is, is a resource that kind of pulls in, it's a website that pulls in a lot of different education resources in genomics, and there is a link there as well to these discipline-specific genomic competencies. So we currently have uh, published competencies for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, PAs, and genetic counselors uh, in genomics. And uh, there may be varying levels of pharmacogenomics competencies across these different disciplines. Uh, we do see um, the most uh, competency standards in pharmacogenomics for pharmacists, but certainly is relevant uh, for other healthcare professionals, particularly those who prescribe medications. A really key point here that I'd like to emphasize is that pharmacogenomics education is important for all healthcare professionals um, and not just a select group of specialists who are really focused in this space. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Empey, uh, for the second half of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Um, I want to reinforce uh, one of the uh, information elements that Dr. Kamal had just emphasized regarding availability of education that's out in the marketplace. And you're looking at data from one of the um, ISCC PEG scholars from the last couple of years that conducted a survey of professional societies and organizations about their thinking about whether they had enough education to be available uh, for their members. So this was a, a couple hundred organizations that were surveyed. And you can see the majority of them came back uh, asking and stating that they needed major additions to the current education materials. So you can imagine these may be professional societies who are serving their members by offering continuing education or are serving their membership and providing education of all forms that try to keep uh, practice standards current. In all, all providers, these 57% cited maintaining an up-to-date curriculum was a significant barrier to being able to uh, provide this resource to their membership. So where does ISCC PEG come in? So as was mentioned previously, the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics is an NHGRI organization that brings together volunteers who are passionate about educating healthcare practitioners. So over 200 individuals, organizations, and industry members uh, who seek to either contribute uh, education specifically or connect and collaborate with others who have a passion for educating and for thinking about how to disseminate genomics into practice through education. So this group is, is led by uh, Dr. Smezer Smith and Haspel and has a number of individual um, domain expert area subgroups I'll mention in a moment, but the main goals are to identify these educational needs and potential solutions, to share best practices and educational approaches, 
and to develop educational resources, as was mentioned. And if you were to go to genome.gov, uh, you can find a very prominent uh, banner that emphasizes the organization. And I'd, I'd urge everyone to click on the link below or go to um, the ISEC PEG website to be able to learn more and consider joining us. Now, I mentioned those project groups earlier. Uh, today, we'll mention uh, the pharmacogenomic ones specifically, but there's a large number of uh, specific project groups that have a, a variety of different interest areas within genomics uh, that really does offer tons of opportunities to connect with other like-minded professionals who are interested in education. And I have the pleasure of co-chairing this group with Dr. Kamal, as was mentioned earlier, in pharmacogenomics specifically. And one of the things we recognized very early on, as was mentioned earlier, is if you look at the adoption curve that may be familiar to many of you, uh, as we have innovations that need to disseminate into practice, we go through phases where there's innovators, early adopters, and then we begin to, to rise to the early majority, the late majority, and then finally the laggards. But it's well accepted that this chasm um, that happens early in the expansion of adoption uh, is a challenge. It's a challenge to overcome, and it's a focus of education and dissemination. So this is where I think the Pharmacogenomic Project Group and ISCC PEG as a whole can really fill the gap. Our goals in our project group are to create and repurpose pharmacogenomics education content and resources targeted to clinicians, to prepare presentations at clinician professional meetings, to tailor pharmacogenomic education for content for all healthcare professionals, and finally, to educate the public in pharmacogenomics to improve healthcare. So again, really focus at overcoming that chasm to accelerate pharmacogenomic implementation. So I'm really excited to announce and, and really bring to conclusion um, really what's been a multi-year effort among our membership and announce the release of the ISCC PEG pharmacogenomic learning series. This was our group's effort to develop expert content on highly contemporary topics in pharmacogenomics that could be broadly shared and be highly accessible and would meet the need in this evidence gap we mentioned for needing to disseminate education to all healthcare professionals, and particularly to make it uh, broadly accessible and could be disseminated for, to a variety of sources to those organizations uh, and to where the memberships uh, of those groups sought education specifically. So these are the modules that have been developed to date. Again, this is a multi-year effort. On the left-hand side, you see the module titles, and it starts off with nomenclature, moves into pharmacogenomic resources, practical aspects of pharmacogenomic implementation, genetic testing, direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic testing, economics of testing, how to navigate pharmacogenomic test coverage in Medicare populations, and then specific focus areas on genotype-guided clopidogrel treatment, as well as the optimization of psychiatric treatment with pharmacogenomics. And I want to call everyone's attention to the authors. Again, these are volunteers that are providing their time within ISCC PEG to really draft uh, excellent peer-reviewed um, education materials that can be disseminated. So these modules are created, they go through internal review within our project subgroup, and then are uh, shared uh, to external peer reviewers uh, that are in yeah. broad practice areas or broader practice areas for comment, and then finally approved at the NHGRI level for further dissemination. Now, I mentioned our goal was to make sure they were accessible. Um, so the modules that we've created are text-based to start off with. They're self-paced, meaning you can access them on your own busy schedules anytime during the day and on demand. So if there's an interest area, you could simply click. Uh, enroll in the course and uh, step through it. These modules are about an hour long and for most of them and provide, again, expert content um, that are quite engaging and interactive as the way they are developed. So this is an example of a screenshot of the pharmacogenomic resources one. And this is um, how it starts off, explaining about one of the resources that was mentioned previously, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. And then it extends into introducing cases and how to use this particular resource as you walk through uh, engaging uh, interactions with uh, questions, uh, with immediate feedback, 
as to how you may use in particular resources in this example, and even interacting exercises where you can sort and, and try to link concepts together that you were just taught through the education materials. And then finally, uh, additional on sort of higher level beyond multiple choice, matching exercises and other type of interactive ways of engaging the learner around this expert content. It also links out to the external resources uh, that may be useful, that are all freely accessible and, and made available within the program that may be on resources you're familiar with or resources that you need to learn more about that are connected to the education materials. So really excited to be able to say that uh, these are freely offered. Um, they're hosted online. You just need to do a free registration. Uh, and then they're also, we made them available uh, broadly for continuing education with a small fee uh, due to collaboration that we've organized with the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. And again, we've got these uh, education approved for a broad uh, number of uh, healthcare practitioner professions. You can see them listed here, and we're working to continue to expand those for all uh, healthcare professionals to be able to seek continuing education as their profession uh, licensure uh, may require it. But again, if you're not seeking CE, they're also free to learn and freely accessible. So they're available now. Um, if you go to the website that's linked at the bottom there on the genome.gov website, you can find a link within our project group within ISCC PEG. Um, to click on the individual references, you'll be transferred directly to the University of Pittsburgh where they're housed. Again, a very quick um, registration to create an account. So you're able to submit your continuing education if you'd like to do that. Uh, and we'll be increasingly adding more modules as they're completed in production. And we'll be seeking additional interest areas within our PGX group uh, to see if there's other areas of interest within pharmacogenomic as we continue to, to expand the series. So I just want to conclude here today uh, to uh, again offer membership in the pharmacogenomic subgroup with an ISCC PEG. Really easy to join. Just click on the website there uh, and go and visit. Uh, we're seeking new members. I know that ISCC PEG as well, but also our project group. So if you're interested in education, genomic education of any kind, please do join us. Um, we'd love to have new members, uh, either individuals, professional organizations, or representatives from those organizations, industry as well to really uh, advance and try to fill that chasm and that gap in getting pharmacogenomics uh, to be implemented in a greater fashion. Also wanna call your attention, we mentioned one of the earlier sessions that was 11 o'clock Eastern time. And of course this one just finished up, uh, is finishing up now, but there's also another great uh, webinar that is scheduled for 3 p.m. Uh, from Dr. Haydar at St. Jude talking about clinical pearls and pharmacogenomic implementation. So if you go to genome.gov right now and click on the banner image, it'll take you right to the MedGeneEd23 page and all the registration links for Zoom are right there just as you registered for the presentation here today. So with that, we thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, urge anyone to consider if there's questions, uh, we're certainly here to answer them and you can take advantage of the question and answer period. Um, that's that's going on now. And I'll invite uh, Dr. Kamal to, to join me as well if there's any open questions from our audience members. And please feel free to add questions to the Q&A uh, feature. I don't see any questions yet. I may put my, my colleague, Dr. Gamal, here on the spot. Um, can you share a little bit about um, your participation in ISCC PEG and the pharmacogenomics group? In terms of maybe how long um, you've been a part of it and, and what you um, enjoy participating in? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe I joined back in, in 2017, so I've been a part of it for quite a while. Um, it's, it's really a great forum to meet others in the field who are also passionate about pharmacogenomics education. Uh, so I've really enjoyed um, getting to know others in the field and, again, collaborating on efforts such as our, our new learning series, because um, that's something that as, as someone in the field, I hear all the time when I give presentations is like, how can I learn more? What are what are available resources? Is there anything that's 
freely available um, uh, for me to learn more about this. So it's really great. I, I feel really um, honored to be a part of this, to be able to put something like that out there and be and be a part of this group that's doing that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I really enjoyed it and recently became a co-chair with, with Dr. MB. Um, not too long ago, Dr. MB has, has provided really great leadership um, for this group for the last several years. I don't know if uh, Dr. MB, you want to talk a little bit more specifically about your experience as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, one of the things I enjoy the most is actually the interprofessional nature of it. Uh, we have folks from all disciplines on and really passionate. And it's really nice to see, especially a volunteer-led organization, able to contribute and get such a, a important deliverable across the finish line. Um, so we're proud of the model that we developed and the partnerships and the ability to disseminate that. Absolutely. So it looks like we have some questions uh, yes. as well. Um, so the first one is um, from Tina Butler. These modules are great. How do you envision health system is using these? Maybe I can tackle that one um, sure. first. Um, so they're they're accessible. Um, so which means anyone really can access them from anywhere, and um, they're you know geared to be for um, learners at all levels. So they're not expecting anyone to have significant foundational knowledge to start. So if there is a, an interest group uh, within a health system uh, that would like additional training, um, individuals can sign up. Certainly healthcare professions can direct folks to it. Again, there's no additional requirements for um, any partnerships or um, you know, payment for to be able to access them. They're designed to be a freely distributed resources. Um, and we've made them short and sort of um, focused in that way so they can be bite-sized. You can select the ones that are of the most uh, interest to you. The next question is about, uh, will the recordings of these lectures be available and how to access them? So yes, they will. Um, I, I believe there was a link that was pasted in the chat at the beginning of the session. Um, it's the Healthcare Professionals Genomics Education Week through the genome.gov website where um, you kind of registered for all of this. So there'll be links to recordings um, soon for, for these different sessions this week. And then I think the next two questions are maybe somewhat similar. Um, the membership is wide open. We do have uh, members in our project group that are from Europe, um, so you're certainly welcome to join. Um, and it is not only for folks working in healthcare specifically. We have patients in some situations. We have, you know, the lay public. We have folks. That really, the interest is that you have an education, an interest in education in genomics, um, and those multiple different perspectives I think are really an asset as we develop education that meets the needs of a variety of learners. Then the last question here, um, how can current genetics undergrad students become more involved in pharmacogenomics within their coursework? Is it possible to aid in the ISC PEG effort at this level? Um, so there is a, an ISCC PEG scholars program um, whereby um, trainees can um, apply and it's a, a two-year commitment um, and basically you'd be paired with a mentor in a project group and work on a, a project related to genomics education. Um, and so on the ISCC PEG webpage, there's, I think there's a link there, information there about the scholars program and that kind of application process. Dr. Empey, do you have anything else to add around that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So it is mentored. Um, so the goal is that we will partner a, a scholar with a mentor uh, within the organization where the projects make sense and line up. And there's typically uh, a admissions process in the fall. So I'd encourage folks to look on the website as it, get, as it approaches the end of the summer and early fall. But we've had several um, rounds of scholars um, and really it is it is competitive um, to be able to um, be selected, but it's a wonderful opportunity to get connected with uh, educators uh, who are excited about disseminating uh, genomics education in whatever area of genomics you're interested in. Uh, just to reiterate, and I could maybe in closing, um, these, this recording will be available on genomes.gov. Um, it'll take us a little bit of time to get it up, um, but we'll be sure to make sure it's disseminated there. Uh, and with that, on behalf of Dr. Kamal, uh, Kamal and I, uh, we certainly uh, appreciate everyone's attendance today and hope you enjoy the education materials that are available. And again, would encourage you to join ISCC PEG 
if you have any interest at all in genomics education, and we'd, we'd love to have you. Thanks, Thank you everyone. so much. Thanks.